Over the last 700 days, I've transformed this cave into my ideal create mod workshop, but I'm not even close to being finished yet. So over the next 100 days, I'm going to upgrade previous builds and build a massive skull containing a bulk haunter. But before I made any of that, I wanted to put the newly added create plus mod to good use by combining my enchanted netherite helmet with my engineer's goggles. Now I could be both an engineer and be properly protected with the super cool added bonus of definitely not looking like an idiot. But regardless of how stupid I did or did not look at the time, I still had work to do, so I crafted a bunch of quartz blocks along with grabbing some other building blocks before beginning to clear out a new area next to the chocolate factory elevator. Once I had a decent chunk carved out, I started laying down quartz blocks to plan where I wanted to build the massive skull that would eventually be the entrance to my bulk haunting setup. I first made the outline of the mouth and then attempted to make the outline of the head. The head outline definitely took a few revisions since initially it was way too skinny and kind of looked vaguely like the guy from the screen painting, but eventually it looked partially sort of kind of semi-acceptable, which was good enough for me at the time. I brought a stone cutter over to the skull and cut some quartz stairs that I then used to add some detail and depth to the mouth. After I finished the lower portion of the mouth, I continued building out the rest of the skull using the stairs and quartz blocks to add additional layers to the face. I spent a super long time trying to get the shape of the nose and eyes correct, which I guess seems appropriate since I also kind of suck the most at drawing those when I'm drawing a face in real life as well. Many, many, many iterations later, the skull was finally looking like a skull when I stepped back to take it all in, which I was super happy with. While standing back to look at the skull, I did notice the area around it was a bit, let's just say messier than I'd like, so I cleared out a lot of the random clay and stone and replaced it with deep slate. I felt like the difference was super noticeable right away since the deep slate contrasted with the quartz really nicely, but when I went to take a look from across the deadly chasm, conveniently situated right in the middle of my base, I realized the view was almost completely blocked. I figured it would be a project for future rage once there was something worth actually seeing on the other side and return to finish filling in deep slate around the skull. Once I finished cleaning up the area around the skull, I started digging out a room directly behind the mouth to use for the bulk haunting setup. I wasn't sure exactly how big the room would need to be since I had absolutely zero clue how I wanted to make the bulk haunter. So I only cleared out a small room before heading back to the main area of the base to collect the create blocks I would need. I managed to snap majority of the blocks I would need from my extremely messy create block dump chest, but unfortunately there were still some that needed to be crafted. The main reason I say unfortunately is because if you couldn't already guess, the main block that had to be crafted was the crushing wheel, or four to be more exact. So I sat back and drank some water, read a book, you know, caught a quick nap while waiting for the 0.1 RPM mechanical crafter setup to do its thing at record speed. After the crafting was done, I filled some buckets with lava and headed back to the skull. I spent the rest of the day trying to plan out how I wanted any aspect of the bulk haunting setup to actually work since I wanted it to be both functional and be super over the top and cool, but a lot of times that's easier said than done. The next three days were a whole lot of the same with me trying my hardest to visualize and then build an overly complex bulk haunter. I won't bore you all with the details since none of this ended up being the actual final setup, but it represented the real life engineering process quite well. There was a lot of standing around staring at a wall trying to visualize something, lots of redesigning, some amount of reconsidering my life decisions, and just a little bit of crying sprinkled in on the side just for good measure. I came back the next day with a new idea in mind and started out by just tearing down everything I had built and dumped it all in a chest outside the skull. I dug out a four x four area in the center of the room and filled in all the random holes in the wall from the old design. Since it was getting a little bit cramped, I cleared out some more space at the back of the room and then dug the four x four area deeper to eventually house the bulk haunter. With the general layout of the room ready to go, I went to grab some encased fans from the auto crafting room, but quickly realized the encased fan mechanical crafter wasn't hooked up right and spent the rest of the day fixing it. I let the newly fixed auto crafting system run for a bit and once I had 16 encased fans, I mosey back over to the skull. I placed the encased fans in the walls of the 4x4 area with soul sand in front of each one and the entire middle filled with depots to have items bulk haunted on top of. I wanted to use mechanical arms to load and unload the depots, so I spent a while planning out where the arms would need to go to be able to access all the depots. After seeing the slightly disappointing range of the mechanical
mechanical arms. I plan to split the setup into two parts and mirror it right across the middle. So I went back to my extremely slow mechanical crafters and made four more crushing wheels. I needed more space to work with yet again. So I cleared out another layer on both sides of the room. I fiddled with a few designs for the sand generation, but settled on two sets of stacked crushing wheels with a barrel below them to store the sand in. I put down a chute to collect the sand in the barrel and used a brass funnel to eject the sand out of the front of the barrel onto a depot. I was pretty happy with how the design was looking, so I duplicated the exact same build directly on the other side of the room. With the sand generation done, it was time to get some cobble fit into it, so I put down a chute over the top set of crushing wheels with a mechanical drill set to break the block directly over it. I dug into the wall next to the chute and put down some stairs to hold the cobblestone generator water and then put the lava above the chute. If I'm being honest, the setup really wasn't anything fancy, but it seemed relatively clean to me, so I duplicated the exact same thing on the other side of the room yet again. The logical next step was to power everything and see if it even worked, so I cleared out some space next to the crushing wheels on both sides of the room and built a three long water wheel setup on each side. I started out by connecting the crushing wheels to the power by putting gearboxes behind each wheel and then running a belt right up the wall behind them. Once I checked they were running in the correct direction, I started trying to bring the power over to the mechanical arms and the encased fans. I put a line of encased chain drives behind the encased fans so I could easily make all of them spin in the same direction, but it still took me ages to get the correct direction of rotational power even going into those chain drives. I'd hook something up, walk in front of the fans, and every single time they would break my heart by pulling me in instead of pushing me away, which now that I think of it seems kind of backwards. After I got the first side of fans working, I used the same setup to get the other side spinning in the correct direction as well, which gave me a much needed but completely fake confidence boost. The last two pieces of the puzzle were the two remaining sides of encased fans. So I ran another long line of encased chain drives behind the fans on the back wall. And right as I connected them, the system overstressed. My extremely elegant solution to this problem was simply to just throw more water wheels at it. So I added on one additional water wheel and on a positive note, the system started running again, but on a negative note, the fans were going in the wrong direction again, which I, I should have just assumed would happen because why, why wouldn't it? Why wouldn't it happen? I used an extra gearbox going into the encased chain drives to flip the direction and then, you guessed it, repeated the same exact process on the other side. Unfortunately, as some of you keen observers may have noticed, I did miss one critical piece of the system, powering the drills. So I pillared my way up to the ceiling and flipped the drill from one side of the chute to the other. I used gearbox and some cog wheels to get power up to the drill and then place down the water where the drill used to be and the lava again above the chute. I reconnected the rotational power and once I saw sand on the depot, I knew I was good to do the same exact thing to the other side. I also picked up the inputting mechanical arms and properly set their inputs and outputs along with lighting the soul fires to start converting sand into soul sand. Majority of the technical work was done, but I couldn't forget the flint and clay that I saw in the barrel. So I slapped a smart chute down under each barrel with a flint and clay filter and put lava below it to avoid overflowing. I also had to store the soul sand somewhere. So I put down two barrels on the back wall with funnels inputting from depots and then set the inputs and outputs of the outputting mechanical arms correctly. To finish off the build, I covered the bulk haunting area in glass and stood back to watch the mechanical arms fly all over the place. Eventually, I did get bored of watching the mechanical arms flinging themselves around like the arms of the inflatable guys outside a used car lot and started clearing out the dump chest that I had outside the Skull. I used the remainder of the day to do a ton of trading to repair all my tools. At this point, it was getting a little bit difficult to remember which of the villagers I had traded with and which I hadn't, so I added some form of automated villager trading to my to-do list for a future video. I spent the next three days overhauling the walls outside the skull to make it look old and kind of overgrow. I used a mix of stone, cobble, and mossy cobblestone, along with deep slate, cobble deep slate, and my patented moss block technology to really bring the entire area to life. Once I got the initial layer of blocks down, I went through and put vines growing down the skull, glowberries hanging from the ceiling, and even included some leaf blocks to add in a slightly different shade of green. When I stepped back to take it all in, I was actually amazed I was the one who built it since this quickly became my favorite build in the entire series. With the outside done, it was time for me to decorate the bulk haunting area inside the skull. So I tore up the floor and replaced it with deep slate tiles lining the outside of the room and 
polished and a slight covering the rest. I wasn't really thrilled with how the floor was looking, but I figured maybe finishing the walls would help. So I mined up some of the walls and put spruce logs in the corners with deep slate tiles lining the entrance. After a good night's sleep, both in game and in real life, I decided the current interior design sucked. I tore up the entire floor I had placed down the day before and replaced it with the same overgrown cave block palette that I used outside the skull. Once the floor was done, I tore down the partially completed walls and instead used the overgrown cave blocks there as well. I chose to use oak logs in the quarters over spruce because I felt like it better matched the lighter stone and cobblestone colors and would also pair nicely with the inevitable heaps of barrels that I would use to decorate the room. I even made a conscious decision of not having all the oak log supports in the corners identical to make the room look more like a real abandoned overgrown kind of cave. With the base layer complete, I crafted a bunch of slabs and did a second pass through the room to replace some of the full blocks in the floor with slabs for a bit of added depth. It seemed like such a small change when I was doing it, but standing back to look at the whole room once I was done showed it was well worth the time. I was so thrilled with how much better the room looked from adding the slabs that I made a third pass through with stairs to give even more variation to the floor. I also used spruce trap doors and the oak supports in the corners to help break up their texture and color a little bit. I even added in a shelf above the water wheels and used a pot with a flowering azalea in it and a wither skull to decorate it. Seeing how nice the shelf looked, I added in another two small shelves over the other water wheels and also decorated those with pots and flowers. I finished off the detailing for the time being by adding in a few lanterns on the shelves to help light up the room without needing torches. Next on the to-do list was the disgusting ceiling that had yet to be touched, so I pillared up and started clearing it out, which proved to be a little bit of a pain with all the water occasionally spilling out from the cobblestone generator. I ended up replacing the ceiling with, you guessed it, the same block palette as the outside of the skull and the inside floor and the inside walls. To make it a bit less boring, I gave the ceiling a few layers rather than leaving it completely flat, which meant it took a little bit longer to clear out, but also looked way nicer. I wanted to continue improving the ceiling, so I slapped down a bunch of leaves because leaves are awesome and also because, uh, I mean, why not? I also took the opportunity to move the soul sand storage barrels back one block since the back wall was finally done. This meant resetting the mechanical arms inputs and outputs, and this time I didn't use depots since I actually needed to have the arms input directly into brass funnels if I wanted to filter for only soul sand. I guess on top of being annoying, the water spilling everywhere also managed to put out the soul fires, so once everything else was fixed, I relit all the fires and everything seemed to be working again. At this point, I was super happy with how the room was turning out, but the torches sitting everywhere were bothering me, so I hung a bunch of lanterns from the ceiling to fully light up the room. I may have gotten a little bit carried away again and decided to add stairs to the walls as well. Apparently, now I'm just addicted to detailing, so what you know, just sue me. Sue me. After all the lanterns were down, I removed the torches inside and made my way outside the skull to cover all the torches that were out there using the moss trick. By the end of the day, the build no longer used any torches, which was a huge win. Since the build was now finished, I took a few trips back and forth to the storage room to clean out my inventory in the dump chest that I had full of random building blocks. While I was running back and forth, I noticed the charcoal chest fueling the steam boilers was a little bit low, which I figured was from me being too far away and not having the tree farm loaded for majority of the time. To fix this issue and to try to avoid having to painfully restart the steam boilers, I spent the next two days bone mealing saplings at the tree farm to try to give a nice backlog of charcoal that should ideally hold me over until I could come up with a more permanent fix. Along with not being in range of the tree farm while working, I also noticed I wasn't in range of my beacon. So I decided to fill the area behind the iron generator and make a second beacon. It took a lot of cobbled deep slate to flatten out the entire area. And once that was done, I planned where the beacon would go and dug up to the surface so it would have visibility to the sky. I built the beacon out of iron this time instead of gold, since I wanted to eventually make one of every kind of beacon in the base. And I set this one to give haste too, because I miss being a speed miner. I then went on a huge detailing spree using moss, moss carpets, and very much shrubbery because there was way too much cobbled deep slate and everyone knows I'm both the cobbled deep slate guy and the moss guy. While I was working on the beacon, it bothered me that the skull that I had worked so hard on still wasn't very visible. So right when I finished, I started hacking into the stone hanging from the ceiling in front of the skull. I also made good use of my new haste buff and cleared out the mess of rocks jutting up next to the beacon. Nearly everything was looking good, except there were some vines still in the way, so I pillared all the way up to the ceiling and got rid of those as well. The skull was looking so good that I wanted to continue working on it and make it more than just a bulk.
small haunting setup, so I started clearing out another room behind the storage barrels. Once I had a decent sized room cleared out, I ran back to the main part of the base to collect a bunch of create blocks to make a washing setup to turn all the excess soul sand into nether quartz. Majority of the blocks I needed were in my create dump chest, but I did have to resupply some of the barrels in the auto crafting room to get the rest of what I needed. I started out the washing setup by putting down two short belts behind the soul sand barrels with brass funnels pulling items onto the belt and depots on the other end. I spent some time trying to plan out how to use a mechanical arm to pull items off the depots, but eventually just gave up on that and made the belt where the soul sand would eventually be washed. My goal was to have a small waterfall flowing behind and under the belt, so I dug out the path for the waterfall, leading to a pool on the other side of the room. The room still felt a bit boring though, so I dug out an alcove above the waterfall for another small pool that the waterfall would flow from and made the pool it would flow into even deeper. And if you're confused by what I just said there, that's probably fair because as I'm recording it, I'm confused a little bit too. With the shape of the room done, I dumped my entire inventory in a chest, filled it up again with building blocks, and went to town over the next two days, decorating the back room with a similar style to the rest of the skull build. I returned to the technical aspect of the build by yet again trying to figure out how to move the soul sand from the barrels to the belt in a semi-cool way. The mechanical arm just seemed way too in the way, since it would have to be right at the doorway, so my next thought was to use weighted injectors to just fling the items on over. It did seem a little bit difficult to plan the whole thing out without any rotational power for testing, so I cleared out some space at the lower pool and put down three water wheels with a waterfall running over them to generate power for the entire room. I'm not trying to brag or anything, but my room now had two waterfalls when some people's rooms have zero. So how about them apples? I spent the next two days trying everything I could think of to get the weighted ejectors to work. I brought the rotational power from the water wheels over to the barrels and spent forever trying to figure out a good way to power the weighted ejectors. Unfortunately, their power input is super limited and with blocks going in one side, my only option was to input power on the side next to the water, which looked absolutely horrible. Eventually, I got so annoyed I gave up and started hooking up the rotational power to the washing belt and the fans. Once those were both working, I put down some barrels with a brass funnel to store the nether quartz in once it was washed. Much like earlier, a good night's sleep in game and in real life gave me a new idea, so I tore down the belts and funnels for the item output, along with a fair bit of the rotational power transportation running underground. I placed an encased fan below the washing belt with chutes above it that the soul sand would be pushed up. I changed the chutes to have glass since it would look super cool and made a belt system underground, pushing the soul sand into the lowest chute using a brass funnel. I put a brass funnel ejecting from the top chute onto the washing belt and finished running the underground belt system to the soul sand barrels with smart chutes under each to drop a controlled amount of soul sand at a time. At this point, the system was fully set up, so I watched it run for a bit and there didn't seem to be any major issues, which is always a good thing. I spent the rest of the day styling the room's messy walls and floor and mined out more of the back wall to make the room a little bit less panic inducing for people with claustrophobia. While I was working, I realized I shouldn't convert all my soul sand into nether quartz, so I grabbed some stockpile switches and dug down to put limits on each of the chutes. My keen observation skills allowed me to see I was missing a smart chute, so I placed it down and figured I could probably wash more than one piece at a time, so I set both chutes to instead drop 16 soul sand. I put a filter for gold nuggets and nether quartz on the final brass funnel just in case any soul sand didn't get properly washed, and then sat back to make sure stacks of 16 could in fact be washed in time. After a few minutes, I was feeling pretty confident there wouldn't be any issues, so I returned to the barrels and put a stockpile switch behind each one to read its soul sand levels. I realized pretty quickly that normal redstone wouldn't work for two adjacent chutes, so instead I used redstone links with different frequencies to wirelessly relay the signal a single block. Kind of stupid, but it worked. I set each stockpile switch to make soul sand drop when the barrels were 75% full and stop when they reached 50% full. With all that set, I yet again sat back to watch the process and verify the redstone functioned as planned since a lot of times it definitely does not. Eventually, the flow of soul sand stopped due to the redstone, which meant it was working properly. This meant the technical portion of the build was completely finished, so I spent the next three days adding in additional decorations to the washing area, much like I had in the haunting room. Everything was coming together, but I ran out of leaves, so I had to make a quick trip to the tree farm to burn through a pair of shears and get a few stacks of leaves. I figured three stacks of leaves was probably sufficient for like maybe one more room, so I returned to the washing 
washing room and finish decorating. My final plan for the room was to have a train at the back heading up to the surface where I would have a mob farm. So I mined up the floor at the back wall and put down polished andesite where the tracks would eventually go. I ended up having to clear further back since it didn't seem like enough room for a train, which meant dealing with a huge pool of water again. But thankfully, my new fancy goggle helmet combo with respiration made it a little bit easier. I raised the polished andesite one block, added in slabs going up, and finished off the area for the time being by putting down the tracks in the train station. On my way back to the main base, I did a quick check of the fuel chest for the steam boilers, and again I noted it was basically empty, which was a big problem. I decided it was finally time to fix the issue once and for all, and filled some buckets up with lava to do some testing. I collected a mechanical arm, depot, and some blaze burners so I could see how fueling them with lava buckets would even work. I slapped down a depot, a blaze burner, and a mechanical arm next to the steam boilers and did my test run, which showed the mechanical arm would hold the empty bucket unless given an output suitable for said bucket. After seeing the functionality of the mechanical arm with the lava bucket, I had an idea in mind, so I collected all the dripstone and create fluid components that I had, along with doing a large crafting session to make even more fluid pipes, pumps, and a lot of cauldrons. With all the blocks ready to go, I used hoppers to make a buffer for each fuel depot and tore down the entire belt system, bringing excess wood over to the steam boilers. With the area next to the boilers now open, I figured it would be a great place to put the new lava generator, so I cleared out a small chunk of the wall, filled in the walls with cobbled deep slate, and then put down tons of cauldrons with pipes below each one to eventually pump out the lava. I tried fiddling with the design a bit, but eventually just went back to the original and connected a pump, pushing into a spout over a depot where the buffer chest used to be. The basic layout of the lava generator was done, so I started putting down dripstone over each cauldron, but it kind of looked off since the ceiling was super low. I decided to raise the ceiling by one block, but ended up accidentally raising it too much, which also looked weird. Thankfully, I managed to get it right on the third try and was able to clear out the space above the dripstone to start putting down lava. I carefully filled in the area with lava by blocking out sections at a time since I had to keep running up to the original lava generator to refill each bucket. It took a few trips, but I was able to finish it off relatively quickly and patched up the area in hopes I'd really never have to touch it again. I finished off the day by attempting to map out how weighted ejectors could throw the empty buckets back to the belt system, but yet again, I was bested by the weighted ejectors and decided to just come back to the idea later. The next logical step was to get everything hooked up and running. So I ran rotational power from the steam boilers over to the belts and ejectors, and everything was relatively simple to connect. Hooking up the pump was super easy as well, since I could pull directly from the belt and just had to flip the pump direction manually. The only downside of all this being so easy was I pretty quickly had to return to the weighted ejector situation, which I fiddled with for the rest of the day. By the end of the day, I had a relatively satisfactory setup that used a depot with a filtered brass funnel to input into the weighted ejector. I didn't want to have the steam boilers shut off, so I cleared out everything and quickly picked up and reset the mechanical arms inputs and outputs on each boiler to use the new weighted ejector along with the old depot. Everything seemed to go smoothly, so then I just sat back to wait for a bucket to be used to verify everything worked. It took nearly an entire day for a bucket to be used because the blaze burners had to fully burn down first, but eventually one was consumed and everything worked flawlessly. It looked super cool with buckets flying everywhere, but because I forgot to put in more buckets for a backlog, the system pretty quickly shut off and I had to manually start it back up again, which is always such a massive pain. I made sure to put in more buckets in the loop once it was back up and running to try to avoid it shutting off again and finished off the day by sorting all the junk from my inventory in the dump chest that I was using. I spent the next three days decorating the train tracks in the back of the washing room like an abandoned mine shaft. I had to tear up the old polished andesite and expand the area even further back into the wall so I had room to work, but once I got the oak support beams up, I knew it was gonna look perfect. I decorated the walls only using stone, cobblestone, and andesite and brought the ceiling down to the support beams so it looked like they were actually helping hold it up. I also wanted to use cobwebs but didn't have any anywhere, so I took a lengthy trip to some nearby abandoned mine shafts and collected a whole bunch before returning back to the base. I finished off the train tracks by placing down arguably a few too many of the cobwebs that I had just collected, along with chains and lanterns and barrels. I had no idea what kind of train I would even be able to fit in here, if any, but that didn't matter because it looked so good. With the new area looking relatively complete, I started digging a tunnel up to the surface since I wanted whatever train I made to actually go above ground. 
down. It was a bit of a pain at the start since my arch nemesis, Large Pool of Water, made a startling appearance yet again. It took a long time to clear out the tunnel because the ceiling needed to be super high, but at the end of the day, I thought I had a genius idea. I gave up on mining the tunnel for a bit and collected tons of create blocks so I could make a train and see if it was possible to just lift the train straight up on the tracks using a rope pulley. I cleared out extra space behind the train station and made a super quick makeshift train for testing purposes. I placed down some additional tracks and glued everything together before attempting to hand crank a rope pulley. Unfortunately, nothing moved, not even an inch, and every iteration of the design I tried had the same exact result, which meant the super cool idea was a little bit of a bust. I returned to mining the tunnel to the surface the next day, and honestly, it was pretty boring. Thankfully, I managed to break through at some point in the night and was pretty darn excited to be done. On my way back down the tunnel to go catch a quick nap, I noticed I had accidentally messed up the tunnel pattern, but decided to fix it later when I was running the train tracks all the way up. After another good night's sleep, I returned to the tunnel and started running the train tracks all the way up to the surface. The process was slightly annoying since I had to go at it in 25 track increments, but it was nicer than using minecart rails, so I guess I'll take it. When I got to my little mistake, I placed an additional layer of stone down on each step to fix it and then connected the rest of the tracks when it was all done. Leveling the tracks off at the surface was also kind of odd, but I quickly fixed the issue and then ran down the tunnel to give the scuffed train a quick test drive. While the train worked perfectly, there was a little bit of an issue with the tunnel, so I made my way back down the tunnel another time, shaving one layer off the roof on every step so it wouldn't try to kill me. Now that I had a way to the surface, it was time to start setting up the mob farm, so I collected lots of stone and crafted up a few observers, dispensers, and a lot of redstone repeaters. I also wanted to make some scaffolding, so I bone mealed a bunch of bamboo and crushed down wool in the ore processor to get some strength. I figured nearly a stack of scaffolding would be sufficient for the time being to keep you all from cringing while watching me build. With my inventory full, I rode the train to the surface and spent the next two days working on designing the mob farm. Initially, I chopped down some trees and leveled out a small area right next to the train tracks where I started building the mob farm that I had seen a cookie god make so many times in his videos. In relatively classic rage fashion, I changed my mind as I was about to finish the first layer of the mob farm and just tore it all down before choosing to instead copy Shulkercraft's mob farm. I won't bore you guys with all the details because you've probably already learned how to make it or you could go watch a video on how to make it if you want to, but I basically just dug a big hole in the ground. Unfortunately, at some point during that process, I killed the pillager and figured I would get rid of the debuff later. Little did I know I was making a huge mistake. I went back down into the base for some reason that I can't even remember anymore while I'm recording this because I was being so stupid. And right as I got to the storage room, a raid was triggered. I immediately freaked out because I have quite literally never done a raid before in my entire Minecraft career. And I ran around the base expecting it to just be flooded with pillagers in no time. But nothing was there. I guess they were all on the surface waiting for me, which was better than being cornered by them in a cave. So I geared up and made the possibly dumb decision of taking the elevator up to the surface. Thankfully, the entire raid wasn't guarding the top of the elevator. And instead, they were all huddled in a random spot by the beacon light, which made fighting them pretty interesting. On one hand, it was super nice because none of them really attacked me. But on the other hand, it was also a huge pain because none of them could be lured away from the rest of the herd. The entire raid wasn't super difficult. It was just extremely extremely annoying because every time I walked too far to the north, my game would crash due to a create bug from a specific funnel loading in. I think I crashed roughly four times by the end of the raid, but that equaled the number of totems I got, so I guess it all kind of evened out in the end. I wanted to make use of the hero of the village buff after the raid, so I did a bunch of trading with the villagers down in the base. Most of the bonus gifts that I got were total junk, but I held on to them just for a little bit so the villagers wouldn't feel bad that I didn't like their stone shovel or stone pickaxe gift. When I finished trading, I noticed the steam boilers had stopped yet again for some reason, which I eventually chalked up to needing even more buckets in the system and the fact that I repeatedly crashed and unloaded lots of chunks during the raid. I manually restarted the system, which was actually pretty easy this time, and then loaded way more buckets onto the belt. It was nearly time to return to working on the mob farm after the quite rude interruption from the pillagers, so I filled my inventory back up with the necessary supplies and crafted all the soul campfires, hoppers, and fence gates that I would need for the killing chamber. The 
initial design would have just dropped the mobs to their death, but the new one burned them to death, which seemed like a more elegant, albeit smelly solution. I spent the next four days assembling the killing chamber, the platforms, and the roof of the mob farm. I had to make a few trips back down to the base to get more building materials, since I really underestimated the amount of stone bricks the build would take, but I was able to quickly leech a few stacks of cobblestone from the gold generators each time, and then smelt them in my OG bulk smelter. Once all the platforms and the roof were built, I wired up the redstone timer on the roof and placed down the observers on each platform that would trigger the dispensers with water buckets. After the redstone was done, I filled in the bottom layer with water, which was extremely annoying and time consuming since I only had two buckets left after putting one in each dispenser. Once the water was done, I felt like I'd aged 10 years and I finished off the mob farm by building up the walls to make it completely dark inside. For the most part, this was pretty mindless, but there were some trees that got in my way and I'm actually really sad to say that I got bested by one and somehow knocked into the mob farm from an inanimate object. In an extremely satisfying end to the build though, I finished off the wall with the last stone brick that I had in my inventory and then hauled the dump chest back down to the base. I sorted all the junk from the dump chest and used up nearly all of my charcoal to craft an entire inventory of torches so I could try to make the new mob farm semi-functional. To save myself the headache, I downloaded a light level mod and enabled it to show where I needed to place torches, which was extremely useful and allowed me to just shut off my brain and spam torches everywhere like a monkey randomly flinging its poo in every direction without a single care in the world. The first three days were spent mostly on the surface, lighting up the entire spawning area around the mob farm, but I did occasionally dip down into caves that I stumbled across because I really wanted to make the mob farm not totally awful. Once the surface was sufficiently lit up, I started trying to find large caves nearby that I could also light up, which involved a lot of digging around randomly until I stumbled across an absolutely massive cave system. I did my best to light up the cave system over the next two days, but it was so big and had so many paths that I got carried away and likely left a lot of the cave unlit. It's definitely an enormous task to light up the new large caves compared to the old ones, so I was sufficiently happy with my progress at the end of day 784 and dug up to the surface from the abandoned mine shaft that I had ended up in. At this point, I was really nervous because if the mob farm didn't function at all, I had just wasted a ton of my time making it and lighting everything up. So I sat a bit of a ways away from the farm and spent the whole day just watching the yellow markers pop up on the mini map to indicate that mobs were spawning and then being killed. As the sun set, I checked the drops and while it wasn't anything crazy, it was better than nothing and would only get better as I lit more up. While I was in the collection room, the water sounded a bit off. So before I slept, I pillared up to the roof and quickly realized I forgot to set half the repeaters to their max setting, which was really messing up the water timing. I fixed the problem and we're all just gonna pretend that that little mistake massively screwed up the rates of my farm. And really it's like a 4,000 item an hour farm like all those pros make. I went back down into the base and sorted all the random blocks I got from the caving, including some diamonds and noticed there was cobblestone all over the ground near my gold and iron generators. I figured this was probably due to me constantly unloading and then reloading the same chunks while running around on the surface. So I collected it and even fixed a backup that it had created in my gold generator by clogging up one of the lanes. I also took out a bunch of andesite from the full andesite generator and then restarted it since it can get pretty messed up if the chest gets completely filled up. The next two days are a perfect example of why I need to automate casing crafting since I spent them making an obscene amount of andesite casing for my next project. I spent nearly an entire day placing down logs a stack at a time and then stripping them before starting on the next layer. Once the logs were all placed down, I spent the entire next day converting the stripped logs to andesite casing and picking them up with my wrench one layer at a time. By the end of the second day, I had 11 stacks of andesite casing, which would probably maybe be enough for my final project. I took my newly made stacks and stacks of andesite casing to the auto crafting room and started loading up the barrels for one of my largest crafting sessions I had ever done. I had to make a lot more andesite alloy since I had just burned through majority of my stockpile making the casing. And while the mixers worked on that, I polished a bunch of rose quartz. I loaded all the additional materials into the auto crafting room and did some random chores around the base while things were being crafted. After a while, I checked on the progress and decided to finish off the day by manually crafting the remaining deployers since I had everything else that I would need. With stacks and stacks of drills and deployers and chassis, I went into the nether and down the tunnel leading to my ancient debris mine. I cleared out some additional space in the tunnel and started assembling the back of a basic tunnel board using linear chassis and some deployers. Don't be fooled though, this wouldn't be just any tunnel bore. It would eventually be the largest tunnel bore ever with the goal of mining a netherite beacon 
beacon worth of ancient debris. To accomplish this goal, I made a massive front face to the tunnel bore using linear chassis, then made all of them sticky and slapped down a deployer on each one. I set the deployer's filters to netherrack and put drills in front of every deployer, except the very outer ones that would maintain a shell around the tunnel to protect from lava. I slapped the plow on the back and added a bunch of chests to store all the goods and set the tunnel bore off. Unfortunately, I forgot to bring one of the billion stacks of torches that I had, so I stopped the tunnel bore pretty quickly, went back to the base to get torches, and returned to the nether with both the torches and a portable storage interface. I slapped the portable storage interface on the side of the tunnel bore to make unloading it a lot easier and set it off yet again to mine me some ancient debris. Over the next two days, I followed the tunnel bore, lighting up the massive tunnel and at least trying my best to avoid the lava, which became pretty difficult at times. I figured the next time I upgraded the tunnel bore, I would add in a similar tunnel in the middle that would be a little bit smaller to avoid the lava issue that stemmed from gravel messing up the lava removal deployers. Eventually, the chests were completely full, so I picked up the tunnel bore with my wrench and made my way back through the tunnel. I had to fight a lot of mobs on my way back, and it definitely got a bit dicey at times, but I managed to make it back at the end of day 798 with just enough time to spare. After getting some sleep to clear up the disgusting rain, I took the tunnel bore up to the surface and placed it down in an open area to start unloading it. I put down a second portable storage interface with a brass funnel for outputting ancient debris and another for dumping all the other junk. I turned the cart assembler on and out came my ancient debris haul, which ended up being 28 total. It wasn't anything too special just yet, but I planned to make the bore a lot bigger in the future. I also ended up switching the filters to drop nether quartz and gold nuggets with the ancient debris and destroyed all the other random blocks with lava. Once the unloading finished, I took all the goodies down into the base and bulk smelted the ancient debris into netherite scraps. I was able to use those to make seven netherite ingots, which was at least a start, but I plan to get a lot more the next time. And with that, it was day 800. Another 100 days were done, and this time, I managed to make a pretty awesome bulk haunter inside a massive skull. Let me know in the comments what you guys thought of the build and if you want to see 900 days next. And as always, be sure to like and subscribe if you guys enjoyed the video.